Hello, and welcome to a tradition. This story we're going to read for you today is about a tradition, and Mom and I started reading this story back in 1981. So that means 18 years, 18 holiday seasons we've been doing this particular story. It's called A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. And I'm doing this as an example for my speech and TV class here at Steele High School. Truman Capote, great American author. If you think about it, you may remember that he wrote In Cold Blood. That was the book probably that he's most well known for. But he's written a number of other things, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and uh, a lot of short stories, <coughs> plays. But this story has always meant a great deal to me. I first uh, found out about it in 1966 when I was in high school. As we read for you today, there are several things that you need to be aware of. There, he will talk about a stereopticon, and I don't know whether you know what a stereopticon is or not, but it's a toy. Uh, be very similar to our Viewmasters today. You put a slide into the uh, toy, and by adjusting it, it appears to be three-dimensional. And so we'll talk about stereopticons and their slides at one point here. We will talk about satsumas, which is a kind of citrus fruit, sort of like an orange. And we will talk about the stars caroling. Now, you have to think about that image for a moment, okay? <coughs> when you carol in the original sense of the word, you sing a song while you dance or move in a circle. And there were carols for all times of the year, not just Christmas. So there were Easter carols and wedding carols and funeral carols. And you sang a funeral carol as a child. Ring around the rosy. Pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. The kids watched the adults singing this and they took it and turned it into a game of their own. So uh, the, the stars caroling. Think about the North Star stays in one place and everything else seems to move in a circle around it. And so the stars can carol if you think of them singing as they move. This um, Truman grew up in Monroeville, Mississippi. He began writing when he was eight years old. He wrote his first story when he was eight years old, and it was published in the newspaper in town, and it upset so many people that they, they turned their backs on him. The people of Monroeville would not talk to him, and that hurt his feelings. I mean, he's only eight years old. His mom left him when he was even younger than that. He speaks about seeing her. He stands in the street and watches her drive away. And she was gone for years. And so the story we're sharing with you today takes place as he lives in Monroeville with relatives, his mom's sisters and brothers. And Sook, the main character that my mom will play or read for you, is um, very much older than he is. And some people thought she was retarded. But she wasn't retarded. She just was very simple, a very genuine, simple woman. Okay, so we're going to read for you Tr uh, Truman's Christmas memory. It deals with the relationship of these two people and the very important holiday tradition for them. Okay. A Christmas memory. Imagine a morning in late November a coming of winter morning more than 20 years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature, but there's also a big round table and a fireplace that just today commenced its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She is wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She is small and sprightly, like a bantam hen. But due to a long, youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable, not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that and tinted by sun and wind. But it is delicate, too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry-colored and timid. Oh, my, she exclaims, her breath smoke in the windowpane. It's fruitcake weather. 
The person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven. She is sixty something. We are cousins, very distant ones, and we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives, and though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not, on the whole, too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy in memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other buddy, buddy died in the 1880s when she was still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed this morning. Courthouse bells sounded so cold and so clear. There were no birds singing. They've all gone to warmer country, yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuits and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've got to make 30 cakes. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that exhilarates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces, It's fruitcake weather. Fetch our buggy and help me find my hat. The hat is found. A straw cartwheel, corsaged with velvet roses out of doors, has faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together, we guide our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. Uh, the buggy is mine. Well, that is, it was bought for me when I was born. It is made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But it is a faithful object. Springtimes we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild fern for our porch pots. And in the summertime we pile it with our picnic and our sugar cane fishing poles and wheel it down to the creek. It has its winter uses too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen and as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived distemper and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is trotting beside it now. Three hours later, we are back in the kitchen hauling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. Our backs hurt from gathering them. How hard they were to find among the concealing leaves, the frosted, deceiving grass. Crackle, a cheery crunch, scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse, and the golden mound of sweet, oily ivory meat mounts in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now and again, my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. Oh, we mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop, and they scarcely enough as it is for 30 cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror, and our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final haul into the fire and with joined sighs watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty. The bowl is brim full. <laughs> we eat our supper. Cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow, the kind of work I like best begins. Buy-in. Cherries and citron. Uh, Ginger and vanilla and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and walnuts. And whiskey. <laughs> and oh, so much flour, butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings. Why, we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there's the question of money. Neither of us has any. <laughs> except for skin flint sums persons in the house occasionally provide. A dime is considered very big money. Or what we earn ourselves from various activities, holding rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries. <laughs> Jars of handmade jam, apple jelly, and eat peach 
preserves. They're rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings. Once we even won 79th prize, five dollars, in a national football contest. <laughs> Not that we know a full thing about football. It's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested A.M. And after some hesitation, for my friend thought it perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan... A.M. Amen. <laughs> to tell the truth, our only really profitable enterprise was the Fun and Freak Museum we conducted in the backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with slide views of Washington and New York, lent us by a relative who'd been to those places. Oh, she was furious <laughs> when she discovered why we borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody hereabout wanted to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups grown -ups a nickel and kids two cents and took in a good twenty dollars before the museum shut down due to the decease of the main attraction. But one way and another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. Now these monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse under a loose board, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. The purse is seldom removed from this safe location, except to make a deposit, or as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I am allowed ten cents to go to the picture show. My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she intend to. Oh, I'd rather have you tell me the story, buddy. That way I can imagine it more. Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, I want to see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except funny papers in the Bible, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished someone harm, told a lie on purpose, or let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done does do. Killed with a hoe, the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this county. Sixteen rattles. Dip snuff secretly. Tame hummingbirds till they balance on her finger. She tells ghost stories so tingling they chill you in July. She talks to herself, takes walks in the rain, grows the prettiest japonicas in town and knows the recipe for every sort of old-time engine cure, including the magical wart remover. Now, with supper finished, we retire to uh, the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt-covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently, wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills tightly rolled and green as May buds. Somber 50 cent pieces heavy enough to weight a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters worn smooth as creek pebbles. but. Mostly, a hateful heap of bitter-odored pennies. Last summer, others in the house contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. <sighs> the carnage of August. The flies that flew to heaven. <laughs> Yet, it was not work in which we took pride. And As we sit counting pennies, it's as though we were back-tabulating dead flies. Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start again, 
According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. Oh, I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. Why, the cakes will fall or put somebody in the cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13ths in bed. So, to be on the safe side, we subtract the penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into our fruit cakes, whiskey is the most expensive as well as the hardest to obtain. State laws forbid its sale. But everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. And the next day, having completed our more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Ha Ha's business address, a sinful, to quote public opinion, fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've been there before, and on the same errand. But in previous years, our dealings have been with Ha Ha's wife, an iodine dark Indian woman with brassy peroxided hair and a dead, tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard he's an Indian too. A giant with razor scars yeah. across his cheeks. They call him Ha Ha because he's so gloomy, a man who never laughs. As we approach his cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish gay naked light bulbs and standing by the river's muddy edge under the shade of river trees where moss drifts through the branches like gray mist. Our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in Ha Ha's Cafe, cut to pieces, hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Well, naturally, these goings on happen at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns in the Victrola whales. In the daytime, Ha Ha's is shabby and deserted. I knock at the door. Queenie barks. My friend calls. Mrs. Ha Ha, ma'am. Anyone to home? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts overturn. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself, and he is a giant. And he does have scars. And he doesn't smile. No, he glowers at us through Satan-tilted eyes and demands to know what you want with Ha Ha. For a moment, we are too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a, a whispery voice at best. If you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like a quart of your best whiskey. His eyes tilt more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing too. <laughs> Which one of you is a drinking man? It's for making fruit cakes, Mr. Ha Ha, for cooking. Well, this sobers him, and he frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shattered cafe, and seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, Two dollars. We pay him with nickels, dimes, and pennies. Suddenly, jangling the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Do you what? He proposes, pouring the money back into our bead purse. Just send me one of them fruitcakes instead. Well, there's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his cake. The black stove, stoked with coal and firewood, glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beaters whirl, spoons spin round in bowls of butter and sugar. Vanilla sweetens the air. Ginger spices it. Melting, nose, tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house, drift out to the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days, 
our work is done. Thirty-one cakes, dampened with whiskey, bask on windowsills and shelves. Who are they for? Friends. Not necessarily neighbor friends. Indeed, the larger share are intended for persons we've met maybe once, perhaps not at all. People who've struck our fancy, like President Roosevelt. <laughs> like the Reverend and Mrs. J. C. Lucy, Baptist minister, missionaries to Borneo, who lectured here last winter, or the little knife grinder who comes through town twice a year. Or Abner Packer, the driver of the six o'clock bus from Mobile, who exchanges waves with us every day as he passes in a dust cloud, whoosh. Or the young Westons, a California couple whose car broke down outside the house one afternoon, and we spent a pleasant hour chatting with them on the porch. Young Mr. Whiston took our picture, buddy, the only one we ever had taken. Is it because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers and merest acquaintances seem to us our truest friends? I think yes. Also, the scrapbooks we keep of thank yous on White House stationery, time to time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinders, penny postcards, make us feel connected to eventful worlds beyond our kitchen with its view of a sky that stops. Now, mm. A nude December fig branch grates against the window. The kitchen is empty, and the cakes are gone. Yesterday we carted the last of them to the post office, where the cost of stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me, but my friend insists on celebrating <laughs> with two inches of whiskey left in Ha Ha's bottle. Queenie has a spoonful and a bowl of coffee. She likes her coffee chicory flavored and strong. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. <coughs> The taste of it brings screwed up expressions and sour <laughs> shudders. But by and by, we begin to sing. The two of us sing in different songs simultaneously. Oh, that's good. I don't know the words to mine, just come on along, come on along, to the Doc Town Strutter Ball. But I can dance. That's what I mean to be a tap dancer in the movies. My dancing shadow rollicks on the walls, and our voices <laughs> rock the chinaware, and we giggle <laughs> as if unseen hands were tickling us. Queenie rolls on her back, and her paws plow the air, and something like a grin stretches her black oh lips. Oh, my gosh. And inside myself, I feel warm and sparky as those crumbling logs, as carefree as the wind in the chimney. <laughs> My friend waltzes around the stove Show with the hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a party dress. Show <laughs> me the way to go home. She sings her tennis shoes squeaking I on the floor. Drink of... Enter two relatives, very angry, potent, with eyes that scold, tongues that scald. Listen to what they have to say, the words tumbling together into a wrathful tune. A child of seven, whiskey on his breath. Are you out of your mind? Feeding a child of seven must be loony. Road to ruination. Oh, remember, Cousin Kate, Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law. Shame. Scandal. Humiliation. Kneel and beg and Pray the Lord. Queenie sneaks under the stove. My friend gazes at her shoes. Her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt and blows her nose and runs to her room. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent, 
except for the chimes of clocks and the sputter of fading fires. She is weeping into a pillow already as wet as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry, I beg. I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering despite my flannel nightgown that smells the last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry, I beg, teasing her toes and tickling her feet. You're too old for that. It's because I am too old. Old and funny. Not funny. Fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop crying, you'll be so tired tomorrow, we can't go cut a tree. She straightens up. Queenie jumps on the bed where Queenie is not allowed to lick her cheeks. I know where we'll find real pretty trees, buddy. And Holly, too, with berries as big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, though, farther than we've ever been. Papa used to bring us Christmas trees from there carried them out on his shoulder. That's 50 years ago. Well, now I can't wait for morning. <laughs> morning. Frozen rhyme, lust as the grass. The sun, round as an orange, and orange as a hot weather moon, balances on the horizon, burnishes the silver winter woods. A wild turkey calls. A renegade hog grunts in the undergrowth, and soon, by the edge of knee-deep rapid-running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie wades the stream first, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current, the pneumonia-making coldness of it. We follow, holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet and burlap sacks, above our heads. A mile more of chastising thorns and burrs and briars that catch at our clothes, of rusty pine needles brilliant with gaudy fungus and molted feathers. Here, there, a flash, a flutter. An ecstasy of shrillings reminds us that not all the birds have flown south. Always the path unwinds through lemony pools of sun and pitch black vine tunnels. Another creek to cross. A disturbed armada of speckled trout froths the water around us, and frogs the size of dinner plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are building a dam. On the farther shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold, but enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine-heavy air. Mm, can you smell it, buddy? Ah, we're almost there. She says as though we were approaching an ocean. And indeed, it is a kind of ocean. Scented acres of holiday trees, prickly-leafed holly, red berries shiny as Chinese bells. Black crows swoop upon them, screaming. I haven't stuffed our burlap sacks with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows. We set about choosing a tree. Now, it should be twice as tall as a boy, so the boy can't steal the star. <laughs> the one we pick is twice as tall as me. A brave, handsome brute that survives 30 hatchet strokes before it keels with a creaking, rending cry. Lugging it like a kill, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, set down, and pant. But we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen. That and the tree's virile, icy perfume revive us, goad us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town. But my friend is sly and non-committal when passers-by praise the treasure perched in our buggy. What a fine tree, and where did it come from? Yonder way. She murmurs vaguely. Once a car stops, and the rich mill owner's lazy wife leans out and whines. I'll give you two bits cash for that old tree. Well, ordinarily my friend is afraid of saying no, but on this occasion she promptly shakes her head. We wouldn't take a dollar. 
That mill owner's wife persists. A dollar my foot, 50 cents. That's my last offer. Besides, you can always get another one. <laughs> In answer, my friend gently reflects. <laughs> I doubt it. There's never two of anything. Oh, home. Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps till tomorrow, snoring as loud as a human. A trunk in the attic contains a shoebox of ermine tails off the opera cape of a curious lady who once rented a room in the house. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age. Silver star, a brief rope of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous candy light, light bulbs. Excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. Oh, I want our tree to blaze just like the Baptist window and droop with weighty snows of ornament. But we can't afford the made in Japan splendors at the five and dime, so we do what we've always done. Set for days at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and stacks of colored paper. I make sketches. My friend cuts them out. Lots of cats fish, too, because they're easy to draw. Some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels devised from saved-up sheets of Hershey bar tin foil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree. And as a final touch, we sprinkle the branches with shredded cotton picked in August for this purpose. My friend, surveying the effect, clasps her hands together. Now, buddy, honest, don't it look good enough to eat? <laughs> Queenie tries to eat an angel. After weaving and ribbon and holly wreaths for all the front windows, our next project is the fashion and the family gifts. Tie-dye scarves for the ladies. For the men, a home-brewed lemon and licorice and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first symptoms of a cold and after hunting. But when it comes time for making each other's gift, my friend and I separate to work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl-handled knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries. We tasted some once, and she always swears. Oh, I could live on them, buddy. Lord, yes, I could. And that's not taking his name in vain. Instead, I'm building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She said so on several million occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in this life to do without something that you want. But confound it, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. Only one of these days, buddy, I will. I'll locate you a bike. Don't ask me how. Maybe I'll steal it. Instead, I am fairly certain she is building me a kite, the same as last year. And the year before. The year before that, we exchanged slingshots. All of which is fine by me, for we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend, more accomplished than I, can get a kite aloft when there isn't enough breeze to carry a cloud. Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butcher's to buy Queenie's traditional gift a good, noble beef bone. The bone, wrapped in funny paper, is placed high in the tree near the silver star. Queenie knows it's there, and she squats at the foot of the tree, staring up in a trance of greed. When bedtime arrives, she refuses to budge. Her excitement is equaled by my own. I, I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a Scorching summer's night. Somewhere, a rooster crows. Oh, falsely, for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, buddy, are you awake? 
It is my friend calling from her room, which is next to mine. And an instant later, she is sitting on my bed holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep a hoot. My mind's just jumping like a jackrabbit. Buddy, do you think Miss Roosevelt will serve our cake at dinner? We huddle in the bed. And she squeezes my hand. I love you. But I feel so bad, buddy. I wanted so bad to give you a bike. I tried to sell the cameo Papa gave me. Buddy, I made you another kite. Then I confess I made her one too, and we laugh. <laughs> the candle burns too short to hold. Out it goes, exposing the starlight. The stars spinning at the window like a visible carolin that slowly, slowly daybreak silences. Possibly we doze. But the beginnings of dawn splash us like cold water, and we're up wide-eyed and wandering while we wait for the others to waken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops a kettle on the kitchen floor, and I tap dance in front of closed doors, and one by one the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both. But it's Christmas, so they can't. First, a gorgeous breakfast, just everything you can imagine, from flapjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the comb, which puts everyone in a good humor, except my friend and I. Frankly, we're so impatient to get at the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. Well, who wouldn't be with socks, a Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, and a year's subscription to a relig religious magazine for children. The Little Shepherd makes me bawl, really does. My friend has a better haul, a sack of satsumas. That's her best present. She is proudest, however, of a white wool shawl knitted by her married sister. But she says her favorite gift is the kite I built her. Mm -hmm. And it is very beautiful, though not as beautiful as the one she made me, which is blue and scattered with gold and green good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is painted on it, Buddy. Buddy? The wind's blowing. The wind is blowing, and nothing will do till we've run to a pasture below the house where Queenie is scooted to bury her bone, and where a winter hence Queenie will be buried too. There, plunging through healthy, waist-high grass, we unreel our kites and feel them twitching at the string like sky fish as they swim into the wind, satisfied, sun-warmed, we sprawl in the grass and peel satsumas and watch our kites cavort. Soon I forget the socks and the hand-me-down sweater, and I'm as happy as if we'd already won that $50,000 grand prize in that coffee naming contest. My, how foolish I am. You know what I've always thought, buddy? I've always thought a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagined that when he came, it would be like looking through the Baptist window, pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through. Such a shine, you don't know it's getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think of that shine, taking away all the spooky feeling but I'll wager it never happened. I'll wager at the very end, a body realizes the Lord has already shown himself that things, as they are, <laughs> just what they've always been. And it's like seeing him. And as for me, buddy, I could leave the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school. And so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, 
grim, revelry-ridden summer camps. They have a new home, too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, alone with Queenie, then alone. Buddy, dear. She writes in her wild, hard-to-read script. Yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie really bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buddy, buggy down to the stip. Simpson's pasture where she can be with all her bones. For a few Novembers, she continues to bake her fruitcakes single-handed. Not as many, but some. <laughs> and of course, she always sends me... The best of the batch. Also, in every letter, she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show? And tell me the story. Gradually in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more, 13ths are not the only days she spends in bed. And the morning arrives in November. A leafless, birdless coming of winter morning when she cannot rouse herself to exclaim. Oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when that happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received, severing from me an irreplaceable part of myself, letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. That is why, walking across the school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky as if I expected to see rather like hearts a pair of lost kites hurrying toward heaven. And that's Truman Capote's Christmas memory. <laughs> okay, now, feedback.